five minutes after 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. I've always loved underdog stories, Robin. Mm -hmm. I've always loved stories about the person who is is striving to do something, the dark horse story, right? The the, the, the one not expected to win, the one not, not expected to do... Any, anything with his or her life, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there are many types of underdogs. In, in the story we're going to hear about right now, it's two ladies, and they're not, they're not underdogs because they are um, not as talented. They're not underdogs because they're not as skilled. They're underdogs for one simple reason, because it's in the 1940s and they're women, and they're journalists, and they're trying to do what their male counterparts do but are treated differently because of the fact that they're women. Now, I know you ladies probably still take on the underdog role because of the man putting you down, Um, but I think even more so back then, and even more so in wartime. This is a beautiful, wonderful story. It is called The Race for Paris. So there are two more elements here that I want to tell you before we introduce our guest and the author. I love underdog stories. I love stories about World War II. Don't ask me why, because this, this... I know war is not romantic, but there's something romantic about that era that I can't yeah. I can't ever explain. I know. It's and then hard. I love stories about Paris. I don't know why either. Maybe I was reincarnated or something. Who knows? Uh, Meg Wake Clayton has skillfully written this book called The Race for Paris. Uh, she, Meg, is a journalist herself, and this book is about two journalists, if I haven't already mentioned that, uh, both ladies. One a photojournalist, by the way. Uh, Meg is a journalist who has written for the L.A. Times, the New York Times, Forbes Magazine, the Washington Post, the San Francisco Chronicle, Writer's Digest, Runner's World. She's contributed to NPR, and her book, again, a best-selling uh, book, is the, the Race for Paris. It's a novel inspired by some real stories, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll yeah. be talking about ladies in journalism. I dated a, a woman who was a journalist. Yes, you did. Uh, bring him, bring yes, him back an old, old memory. Mm-hmm. And, and, and in fact, I went out to L.A. with her, mm-hmm. and uh, that was her dream, was to become a journalist for the L.A. Times. It mm-hmm. did, didn't pan out, but uh, but she, she had her own sets of... Um, um, being put down by the man's stories, you know. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a, a, a weird world we live in, isn't it? Meg, wait, Clayton. Good morning, Meg. How you doing? I'm doing great, Larry. Thank you for having me. How oh, are you doing? Pretty good. Where are you? I am in Palo Alto, California. About as far as I can get from Gainesville, Florida, and still be in the continental U.S. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you for getting up early to be with us today. My pleasure. So is it, as, as a journalist, do you feel that underdog thing, or, or has that gone away? The, the lady I dated was in the 70s, just to give you some perspective. Yeah, well, I think that uh, there are certainly, uh, there are certainly women continue to face challenges that are unknown to men in all walks of life uh, today. It's certainly not, uh, not the same as my World War II journalist faced, but uh, there is definitely, there is definitely uh, still a a struggle, or at least we perceive a struggle. Um, So I don't think that's, I think that's gotten better, but it isn't entirely gone away. How how closely do the two characters that you've created, um, how closely are they to actual, in other words, are they based on two real journalists, or are they completely made up by you? Yeah, um, well, so the story was inspired by the, the actual race for Paris and the real women who were among the first journalists to report um, from the city, from Paris, as it was liberated in 1944. Uh, my two characters, uh, one, Liz Harper, is a photojournalist, uh, and the other, Jane Tyler, is a, a, a journalist, uh, are not real people, uh, but they uh, are their experiences in the novel are drawn from a variety of women who uh, covered the war in in Europe. Uh, and Vicki Chappelle in the Pacific as well, but mostly the women who covered the war in Europe. Yeah. Um, and, and you give us a sense of, of what that must have been like. And, and I, th- I think my reference to my love of underdog stars one quick thing I think it points out it, you don't have to be long to that group I don't, I'm not a woman but, but I still can understand I, I can still um, uh, relate to it I can still see it you know I, I don't have to be a boxer to, to relate to Rocky you know that, that kind no, of thing a- 
That's exactly right. And and the true underdog stories in the world in the war, some of them are pretty extraordinary. Uh, like one of the real journalists, uh, Martha Gellhorn, who uh, who wrote for Colliers, uh, the way she got to war was uh, she wanted to cover Normandy, and no women were allowed to cover Normandy. So she stowed away in the bathroom of a hospital ship to get to France uh, and went ashore with a stretcher crew and became one of the very few correspondents to cover the invasion actually from French soil. Um, but her reward for her bravery, here's the underdog part of it, is uh, she was stripped of her military accreditation, her travel papers, and her ration entitlements on returning to England and confined to a nurse's training camp where she uh, was meant to be shipped back to the U.S. Uh, what she did uh, was hop to the fence, pitched a ride on a plane to Italy, and covered the entire war without the benefit of her swanky military credential, uh, sweet-talking wireless operators into sending her work out uh, in the world themselves, um, while all the time looking over her shoulder for the military police charged with apprehending her. So those are the kinds of, you know, she is the kind of woman that uh, inspired this novel and the kind of experience that I draw from, women who you know, want to do uh, a terrific job uh, as a journalist in World War II Paris and are meeting barriers that uh, they have to climb over, bash through, or work around however they can. Well, you also have the character uh, Charles in there. He himself was a journalist, but then he was an editor, and then he had to take over the paper. And uh, when she was wanting to go out there, you know, he, he had to stay home. He couldn't go. That's exactly right. The The book, although it's a book about war uh, and a book about you know, friendship, it is very much a book about relationships, and that's primarily a book about relationships. It's, you know, one of the epigraphs I use at the beginning is a uh, Martin Amos uh, quote. It's, and yet love turns out to be the only part of us that is solid as the world turns upside down and the screen goes black. He was writing that in the post-9-11 world, um, but it's very true in World War II as well that uh, of all the things that matter in life, there's really nothing quite as sustaining as love. So Charles is uh, Liv's husband, who, you know, in a little bit of turn of uh, events, uh, stays home while uh, Liv goes off to war. You know, he's somebody who's experienced war and is not excited about going back himself and is, is not excited about his... Uh, his wife going either and so that's one of the tensions in the novel although uh, Charles it doesn't play a big role in terms of the his presence in the novel he he uh, is a very big psychological presence in the novel as is uh, Fletcher Roebuck the the other uh, main fellow in the book um, he Fletcher is a British military photographer with a tendency to fall in love with the wrong people, basically. Something I think many of us can relate to, certainly those of us who are underdogs. Not me. Yeah. I've never... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> that, that, women who, that woman who went off to Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're so good. Yeah, do, 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 do you know what I wanted to say, though? By, by talking about it as so much as we have up to this point, um, you've already made it clear that the, the, the things that make the ladies underdogs, and just keep stick with that theme for a second here is just the it's just the the setup it's it's not really the whole story that just gets us to understand why their experience is so much different than it might have been for a male journalist but but you do have so many different dimensions and depths to this story that's that's absolutely right uh that's the setup and it provides a lot of you know some of the tension uh of the novel because there is always the threat that they will be taken into custody and their you know, little adventure uh, will be ended. But the novel explores uh, the experience of war and the experience of people in war uh, on a, on a, in a broad way. I mean, there are certainly plenty of male journalists who show up to, um, to take part in the story in, except for Fletcher, who's a photographer, uh, the other male journalists show up in, in smaller ways, but many of them are real journalists. Um, uh, men like Andy Rooney, who wrote for the Stars and Stripes during the war, uh, and he is actually the person who gave me the, you know, through his through his writing, gave me the title, The Race for Paris, um, which he uh, wrote about as this very spirited competition among the journalists in Normandy 
uh, about who would be the uh, first to report from Paris. Hmm. Uh, so I hope every the book delivers that camaraderie among the journalists uh, in uh, in in reporting the war, as well as you know the experiences of the people living in France as as the troops were coming through and the journalists were coming through reporting on the truth. What, what I think you should be proud of and what is interesting is that 70 years have passed and so many stories have been written um, of all uh, all genres and everything. And I don't think there's been one like this. I mean, you've, uh -uh. you've come up with an idea, you've hit on something that A, has been there all along because it's true, uh, but nobody's told before, and that would be the B part, I guess. Meg Wait Clayton is our guest. The book is called The Race for Paris. I hope you're enjoying the interview. We'll take a little break and be right back with Meg uh, after the, the weather and some commercials. We'll be right back. The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. It'll be partly sunny today with an afternoon thunderstorm in the area, the high 88 to 92. Partly cloudy tonight with a thunderstorm in the area early on, low 74 to 78. Times of clouds and sun tomorrow with a shower or thunderstorm around mainly during the afternoon hours, high 88 to 92. For Thursday, clouds will limit sunshine along with a couple of showers and a thunderstorm, high 86 to 90. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Joe Lundberg. If you're anything like I was, the thought of getting older was the last thing on your mind. But here we are. For me, it started slowly. The lack of energy. Never being in the mood. And when I was, I could never perform at my best. I tried the pills and other treatments with minimal results. And all but given up on my sex life. Then, I found the doctors at New Male Medical Center. Wow! They made a new male out of me. Feel like I'm 25 again. I have renewed vigor. So much more energy. And no longer worry about my performance. New Male treated me like my situation was one of a kind. With a custom treatment plan that really works. I feel great. They can create one for you too. It does not matter if you suffer from low testosterone, erectile dysfunction, or just want to last longer. New Mail will help you. Call New Mail Medical Center today at 352-404-4779. 352-404-4779. That's 352-404-4779. It will change your life. 352-404-4779. Hey, Matt, I know Sunrise Automotive does auto stuff, but I need some tires for my truck. Can you recommend someone? Uh, yes, I can. We do that. No, I mean, I need them installed and balanced and all that. Yep, yep, we do that. Well, my son needed his windows tinted. Yep, we, we do that, I need too. my seat replaced. Yep, yep, we do that, too. I need a new roof line, a new spoiler, and a new Yep, truck. we can even do that, too. Okay, okay, I get it. I suppose you can also do a radio show, too, huh? Well, as a matter of fact, join me every Monday at 10 for auto repair with personal care here on The Source. Of course you do. All right, 18 minutes after 11 o'clock. Commercials just don't go fast enough when, you, when you're enjoying an interview. Uh, all right, Meg, Way, Meg Wait Clayton is on the phone. Her book is, you, you're going to love the book. It's called The Race for Paris, a novel inspired by real frontline stories about journalists, lady journalists as well as some men, who raced the Allies for occupied France, dur, uh, Paris, France during World War II. It's the 70th anniversary, which is coming up, what, the 25th of this month, I mm -hmm. think is what they say. Um, Meg, you know what I didn't know? I what did, didn't you know? I didn't know, and, and maybe I misunderstood this, but I didn't know that when a journalist went to cover a war zone that they were actually under the supervision of the military. I thought they were with private agencies, like with the New York Daily News or something. Well, it's this interesting kind of partnership that went on uh, in World War II where the, uh, the correspondents would be representing a, um, you know, a, a newspaper or a magazine or whatever, uh, but they would also be, because they're in a military, uh, you know, in a war zone, they were under command of a military unit. And so that what that meant for the men was the men were uh, put into press camps. They stayed in tents together at the press camps, and they uh, uh, they were briefed twice a day about where the war was and uh, allowed to go wherever they wanted, basically, uh, to find the news and report the news. Uh, and then they came back at the end of the day and, uh, you know, had whiskey with their friends and wrote their copy and uh, had it wired off to their papers where, where it ran. Mm. Uh, the, women, the women, on the other hand, uh, they were... Not never allowed at the press camps. The excuse given was uh, that there were no ladies' latrines there, and they weren't 
about to start digging them now. Um, uh, this uh, No Ladies Latrines at uh, most of the press camps were at very nice French chateaus with uh, running water and, uh, in one case, literally whiskey on tap. So, uh, oh, oh wow. A bit of a made-up excuse, but the uh, the result for the women was that the women were mostly accredited to uh, field hospitals where they were meant to cover the nurses uh, or uh, things like uh, the Red Cross Donut Girls, uh, positions well behind the front lines, and they were not given access to things like uh, jeeps, uh, and they were not allowed to go cover the fighting. Um, so, so, it, so they had a... So you know, in order to do that, they had to go AWOL, which is kind of weird because they're not really in the military, but mm-hmm. but they're under the the direction of them, and and so then they're subject to the same violations, legal violations, and and yet it, it just seems so odd that I mean, that's their their job, their their whole mission is to cover the war, but they can't really do it. That's exactly right. Well, so. I will say, in the sense of the military, that the military's idea for the women covering the war is that they would cover the what they call the women's angle. They would cover the nurses, and they would cover the Red Cross donut girls, and they would cover the very behind-the-scenes things. But much as uh, you know, we have struggled even today with the idea of women being in a combat zone, you know, women soldiers being in a combat zone. Um, it was even more of a struggle back then when women were more. Uh, more restricted in in the idea we were we had a more restricted idea of what women should do with their lives, uh, but yeah the event, the result was that they had to go a wall without leave, uh, leaving them not only without resources you know without uh, the way to get their work out without uh, jeeps to get around in without even food necessarily uh, or typewriter ribbons or film, um, but also also in danger and with the added challenge of having to uh, evade military police in order to do their job. I uh, like how you provided us with the names of some of the uh, female uh, journalists and photographers. Uh, Dickie Chappelle, her history was amazing to me. Dickie Chappelle is such an amazing woman. You know, we are, we are coming up on, in November, the 50th anniversary of, of her death. Um, she is uh, she is a photojournalist who reported for Fawcett Publications, uh, and she actually covered the Pacific War, not not the European War. But she was an incredible inspiration for this novel uh, because of the kind of woman she is. Um, one of the things she did was she took uh, uh, well she went she she followed the Marines uh, onto uh, uh, into no man's land under enemy fire and learned five days into it that they were that the Marines she was traveling with were hiding her from Navy officers with arrest on site orders for her. Uh, so she turned herself in and then was evicted uh, at gunpoint from the war. But before she did that, she took two photos of a Marine before and after he received 14 pints of blood. 14 pints, can you imagine that? Wow. Uh, yeah, and the two photos were shown together throughout the world, throughout the U.S. And uh, the result was that people who saw the photos went to blood banks to uh, donate blood in oh, huge wow. quantities. Yeah, so it made a, a huge difference in the war effort. And then, um, and then Chappelle had the dubious uh, honor of being the first uh, woman journalist, American woman journalist, ever to be killed in action. She stepped on a landmine mm. while covering Vietnam and, and died there. Wow. Uh, Meg, we have a phone line open, and we have some people calling in. Do you want to take calls? Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right, good. Uh, Meg, wait. Clayton, again, is our guest. The book is called The Race for Paris. Good morning. Thank you for waiting. You're on the air with Meg. Uh, Good morning, good morning. Yes, uh, uh, Martha Gellhorn, uh, the wife of Ernest Hemingway, uh, um, smuggled herself across uh, uh, the channel and and, uh, was able to cover... uh, um, elements of the uh, Allied drive, uh, uh, sometimes yes. in more advantageous position than her husband. Yes, yeah, she did, uh, absolutely. I'll, I'll ring off. Oh, wow. That's... Yeah, I'll, I'll say a little about Martha Gellhorn. She did. She stowed away in the loo to get to the, uh, on a hospital ship to get to France. So uh, certainly uh, women did uh, cover the war uh, and... Uh, did a bang up job of it. Martha Gellhorn's a fine example. She's one of the most extraordinary uh, war journalists that uh, we've ever had. So, do, do you find yourself attracted to that era for for a reason? Is do you feel it's a romantic time? 
Yeah, I think for I, I have the same attraction you uh, have to it, Larry. I was uh, a history major, history and psychology in college, and my focus was 20th century American wars, uh, largely because I'm particularly fascinated with uh, with World War II. And I I think part of the attraction of it is that it it was it was the last war that we well I don't know it. It was a war where we clearly understood why we had to go to war. Yeah, there was, yeah. there was, it was not optional, um, and so it has a little bit of a moral simplicity um, that is, it is ap- appealing. And and one of the results of that is that you can really focus on the heroic efforts that were spent at war, and those heroic efforts aren't undercut by uh, what we often have now, which is the questioning about whether the war ought to be, whether we ought to be participating in wars, which has the result of uh, question of, uh, of dishonoring, I think, sometimes the soldiers who are, are fighting the war. Um, so I think it is a, I think it is a, a little bit of a romantic time. Uh, certainly, like you, I am really drawn to Paris. I got to go spend uh, a month there twice while writing this uh, oh, novel. Oh, nice! Uh, yeah, it was very sweet. I'm thinking of saying my next novel in Paris. I can go a third time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, uh, you, uh, uh, you reference a song Larry and I love in your book. Uh, there will be bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover. That is just such yeah. a, a moving song. Yeah, it's true. Even if you look at the uh, the music from that time, it's it's very romantic music. It's very absolutely. Uh, I've thought this so much. I, I just th- there was something about the way the songs were written throughout that era. Mm-hmm. You know, right, right. And so, part of what I was going for in in writing the novel is is that sense of that. It's told, the story, The Race for Paris is told from the perspective of 50 years later, but I did want to uh, imbue it with that, with that mood, that desire, that, you know, that idea that we were all participating in something that was really important uh, and that would change the future of the world in a way that I think that war did change the future of the world. Absol- absolutely, it did. It did. Uh, and, it, and it molded the, uh, I guess, it, I don't know how old you are, but it molded my parents, it molded Robin's parents, and, mm-hmm. and if you're our age, then it molded your parents. It, we, we, we made it a, ab- we made it a g- absolutely molded. It absolutely molded my parents. You know, I think part of my fascination with the the era is that my uncle Jim uh, was a bombardier in the war, and he came back from the war a total wreck, uh, and mm. he put his life back together and became a lawyer. He was the great t- storyteller of my family, but he never told stories about the war, and it made me even more fascinated with so, it uh, that you he know, wouldn't tell those stories. We, we yeah. bumped into a guy the other day, just real quick, I'll tell you this, and he was... Um, too young for World War II. He was 80, he's 87 now. Uh, so he mm-hmm. went to, to help uh, occupy um, Germany mm-hmm. after the war was over. He went there when it was all done. <laughs> mm-hmm. But right when it was done and, uh, f- and fell in love with a German girl who, um, you know, pro- who lived through all of this, her, her country going through all that turmoil. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. It, it, it is just a fascinating time uh, to, to look back on that we hope never happens again. Um, but yeah. I, I, the book is so wonderful. Uh, I don't like to give away books that are this good, but I'm going to do it. Call me if you want the copy. It's <laughs> called The Race for Paris. I will buy my own. Yes. Uh, go go online to buy yours if you don't win this one, but just call me and, and it's yours. Uh, Meg, do you have a website for yourself? I do. Uh, your listeners can get to it uh, through raceforparis.com. Very easy to remember. Easy. All right. That is easy. Okay. Uh, let me give this one away. Good morning. You've got the book. Who's this? Jim. All right, Jim. It'll be waiting for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Meg, thank you for being on the air with us today. And and, uh, definitely come back. Any future books you want to promote, we'd love to have you back. Thank you so much, um, Larry. I really appreciate the time. And Robin, appreciate it as well. Thanks so much. That was a great interview. We'll take a little break. We'll be right back.
Radio. I'm Lillian Wu. 23 people arrested after a night of violence in Ferguson, Missouri, where demonstrations continue a year after the death of Michael Brown. Earlier yesterday, protesters flooded onto 